All right, thank you, Mr. Woodard. As always, great examples and explanations for terms that can be pretty confusing, especially when you look at just their raw definitions, as you can see there with Fechner's Law. So um, Mr. Woodard talked about both the um, stealing the change out of the change jar, Mr. Woodard, or adding sugar to the coffee. Okay, so I'm gonna just do a quick little review here. Remember, just noticeable difference is how much I have to change a stimulus where I'll notice that change at least 50% of the time. The example you run across quite often with Weber's Law and Fechner's Law is lifting weights. If I have a set of weights and I'm lifting 10 pounds versus 100 pounds, let's go to Weber's Law first. Weber's Law is going to say that for that just noticeable difference to be detected at least half the time, the change in how much weight I add to the stimulus of the original weight is going to change at a constant percentage. So if my original stimulus is 10 pounds, and on a previous slide it said weight uh, was 2%, I don't know if that was referencing lifting weights, but let's just use that for the sake of argument. So if I have 10 pounds, and Weber's Law says that I have that 2% is gonna give me my just noticeable difference, so I'm going to add 0.2 pounds to my 10 pounds of weight, and at least half the time I will be able to detect that there's a, been a change in the weight. If I have 100 pounds, according to Weber's law, if it's 2%, I've got to add 2 pounds to my 100 pounds for me about 50% of the time to detect that there's been a change in that weight. Okay. With Fechner's law, Think about, again, stay with the weights here, the increase in the strength of a stimulus, if my stimulus is the amount of weight that I'm trying to lift, produces a smaller increase in perceived magnitude as I add stuff to it. So if I have a 10 pounds here and I add 0.2 pounds, I'm going to notice it about half the time. If I have 100 pounds and I add just 0.2 pounds, I'm never going to notice that because the increase in the strength of the stimulus produces a smaller increase in me being able to detect that difference. And so just another way to think about Weber's Law and Fechner's Law. Okay, now we're gonna get into some fun stuff here. Sensory adaptation. If you, the, the best example I can give to you of this, after class is over, after school is over, most of you probably have a, a can of coffee in the house or maybe some tea, something that has a pretty strong odor. Grab that can of coffee and just put it up to your nose and leave it there. And it won't take probably more than about 15 or 30 seconds and you'll kind of stop smelling the coffee. You'll still smell it, but really notice what it's like when you put the coffee in front of your nose at the beginning and then 15, 20, 30 seconds later, the, strong, the smell won't smell as strong, and that's because of sensory adaptation. The receptor cells that are taking in that stimulus of the odor of the coffee, they start to lose responsiveness, and then, because that coffee is still there, but the, the, the cells start to lose that responsiveness to the, the, the stimulus of the coffee, and it, it seems like it doesn't smell as strong as when you first put it up to your nose. I don't know if this one will work. You can try it on your own with the, the raw PowerPoint. If you stare at that black dot for a little while, you'll actually notice a change in everything that's around that black dot. I just don't think it'll work right now with all the screens and stuff. I'm not going to worry about that. Now, sensory adaptation is when your nerve receptors, they get used to the smell and they actually stop losing, uh, sensing the smell. They stop, the, the responsiveness isn't as strong. Habituation is behavioral. You're going to decrease a certain behavior because a stimulus is presented over and over and over again. It's going to occur in the brain and not the body. And you can see there, there's the example of a concert. When you first walk into a concert and it's really super loud and you're like, whoa, oh, and you're probably going to put your hands over your ears and stuff like that. You can't talk and you're yelling and all this kind of stuff. Well, after a little while, you'll get used to the noise and you'll be able to converge. You might still be yelling to the person that's sitting next to you, but you're used to it. Your behavior changes. You're not so, you're not needing to cover your ears and stuff. 
you're getting used to the to the environment and so your behavior is changing okay now a few years ago, they put that black railing outside of the south end of Lewis and Clark, kind of down low by that driveway that we have behind the building there. When they, my room is like right on that side of the building. When they first started, it was annoying as heck. Loud machinery, they were, you know, heavy metal, all of this stuff, and it was just loud and annoying. It was right outside my window. They were doing it in like spring, early summertime. So, I mean, windows were open and stuff like that. So, it was really, really frustrating and annoying. It only took, though, a couple of days, and I forgot they were out there. Same noise, same stimuli, but I had habituated to it, and I was perfectly fine. I wasn't the only one either. My students in class, too. Everyone was like, gosh, that's so annoying. When are they going to stop? After a day or two, we just got, all got kind of used to it and habituated to it. Our behaviors changed. All right. Signal detection theory. This is kind of a fun one. Imagine it's Valentine's Day. And it's nice. And you go downtown with your loved one. And you're going to dinner because it's post-COVID. Vaccines have been administered. We can go out to eat now with no problem. So you're walking hand in hand with your loved one downtown and you're you're walking to dinner it's about ah, six o'clock in the evening and it's just all nice and peaceful and all of a sudden right over riverfront park there's a huge explosion boom right up in the sky it's just boom how are you going to react same scenario well let's put some changes to it downtown you're walking hand in hand with your loved one. That's very nice of you, by the way. It's good to hold hands. And you're downtown. Let's say it's about 10 o'clock at night. And now let's say it's July 4th. And about 10 o'clock at night, July 4th, huge explosion, boom, right over Riverfront Park. Probably a lot different reaction than you had on Valentine's Day. That's because of signal detection theory. Signal detection theory helps us to, to our brains whether consciously or subconsciously, distinguish between some sort of signal that should alarm us or that we should pay attention to and just mere noise. Signal detection theory is going to emphasize our decision-making process. It can affect the threshold that we apply to a particular situation. And you can see here, there's a little gr grid that we have. Stimulus event would be the explosion in the sky. The neural activity is taking in that explosion and going, okay, what's going on here? And, and really, the neural activity is just taking in the sound waves, maybe the light waves, all that, transducing them, and creating something that the, um, that the brain can make meaning out of. And then our brains are then going to compare and apply a threshold. Do we act or not act on that particular um, stimulus event? Well, on February 14th, because of our experience, there should be no explosion in the sky over Riverfront Park on February 14th. We aren't expecting that to happen. Our physiological state in this particular instance probably isn't doing a whole lot different, although we might be just super relaxed and calm because we're just wanting to go to dinner. Okay. If it's July 4th, our experience tells us there should be an explosion over Riverfront Park on July 4th. We should be seeing some fireworks. We're expecting those fireworks, and maybe we're kind of excited because those fireworks are going to happen. So all of those things take that same stimulus event, that same neural activity, and our brains compare them and say, okay, do we react to this or not? This explains, if you think about it at night, if you have a downstairs bedroom and it's late at night, if you're, and let's say it's one of the older South Hill homes, a lot of creaky floorboards, right? So if your parents are home and you hear a floorboard creak, it probably won't bother you. But if your parents are gone that evening and you hear that same floorboard creak, it might bother you a lot. You might react a lot differently. And why is that? Because you're applying a different threshold, a different recognition threshold. Your brain is saying you should do something in this particular instance. We talked about highly sensitive uh, persons, highly sensitive people uh, earlier in the year. They're going to have a lower threshold. They're going to notice things sooner than other people might notice them.
Okay. All right, I'm going to stop there. I've been, it's been 10 minutes. That should set up Mr. Woodard for a good review of signal detection theory for the next slide.